Well, Happy New Year to all of you. I'm praying that this coming year will be a year that you will tangibly feel the Lord's guiding, encouragement, and protection. And so I think the gospel that we are about to read is so timely for us to reflect on. And the gospel reading for us this morning is taken once again from John chapter 1. But the focus is different than Christmas Day. We will focus specifically on verses 10 to 18. So John chapter 1, verses 10 to 18, follow along as I read for you. He was in the world, and the world come, came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we once again ask that as we read the prologue of the Gospel of John. We don't just hear words, but we encounter the living Word who is your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. For He is the only one who is able to change and transform our lives. In His name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Um, I am not a celebrity chaser. Never was, never will, and not because anything wrong with being a celebrity chaser. I'm just not one to be chasing celebrities. Maybe it's my issue with pride, actually. And because of that, I've wondered how often I have passed by someone famous and not realized it, or brushed by someone world-renowned and missed it. Well, guess what? People in Jesus' day missed him. He came among them and they ignored him. They were in the presence of God in the flesh and not recognize him. I guess they were not looking for him as he appeared among them as a carpenter. Perhaps they were too busy with their lives. And maybe, like many of us, they didn't want to see Jesus because we need to change, they need to change their lives. In reading John's prologue once again, our focus today is on how John reveals the good news and the bad news about Jesus becoming human. In his prologue, there's the good news and the bad news about Jesus becoming human. And so first, let's look at the good news. Jesus is coming. That's the good news. John states the good news that Jesus is coming. Verse 9, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. The true light that the darkness cannot overcome was coming in our flesh. The true light that would point all humanity to the life as God knows it was appearing in person. The true light that would dispel the darkness of sin and death was visiting us, was visiting our planet. Uh, the people back then did not see any advertisements announcing the arrival of Jesus, but they did have ample warning. God had told them over and over again in many ways. Prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Micah, Zechariah, and Malachi said in one way or another, He is coming. Every story in the Old Testament testifies to one great truth. He is 
coming. The whole theme of the Old Testament is that God would one day send the Messiah, the Christ, to deliver his people. Even astrologers from Persia figured it out when they saw his stars in the east that Jesus was coming. That's the good news. Now the bad news. As good of news that is, there is a bad news. John tells us, He was in the world and the world came into being through Him, yet the world did not know Him. He came to what was His own and His own people did not accept Him. Eugene Peterson in his message paraphrase says, He was in the world, the world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. (laughs) Two responses that people make when Jesus is introduced are revealed in these verses. Now, we would rather not admit them, but they are present in every generation in every society, in every community, and even in every church. And so let's look at those responses. The first is Jesus was ignored. Notice verse 10, he was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. The word for world is cosmos. And in John, it mostly has this meaning of Humanity organizing itself without God. Nevertheless, God still loves this society that ignored him. As John would later say in his most famous verse in John 3.16. Now from verse 10, we learn three quintessential realities. Three fundamental realities. First, the quintessential fact in history He, that is Christ, was in the world. Everything starts with this fact. Christ was in the world. This is more than just a fleeting visit. God walked on this planet for 33 years. He was a flesh and blood human born of a woman with a human nature just like ours. He was born as we are born and grew up through all the stages of Childhood, infancy, toddler, young child, teenager, young adult. He wasn't a robot or an angel or some kind of strange alien from a distant galaxy. He was one of us and walked among us. That's the first quintessential truth. The second quintessential truth is the quintessential truth of history. The world was made through him. In other words, in other words, this world, planet, and people owes its very existence to the word. Just as in verse 3, John repeats and reminds the readers once again that Jesus was the agent of creation. And then the third quintessential truth, the quintessential tragedy of history. The world did not know him. The world did not know him. It is more than just having intellectual knowledge. It is more than not knowing the facts. It means failing to know intimately, like a friend would know another friend. You see, knowing in the Bible is not head knowing. Knowing is mostly a relational term. John the Baptist would say to his followers, referring to Jesus in the same chapter, Among you stands one whom you do not know. This planet and its inhabitants missed a profound opportunity when Jesus visited this planet. They snubbed the introduction of Jesus. There has always been a great divide in humanity. When Jesus came the first time, Herod hated him. The scribes ignored him. And there was no room for him in the inn. Only the shepherds and the wise men, the poor and the foreigners, welcomed him to the earth. But as much as things seem to change, they still remain the same. 
In reality, nothing has changed. Jesus came to the world he created and the world had no idea who he was. The world missed its great opportunity. It did not know the word when the word was in its very midst. The world did not recognize Jesus. So first response, Jesus was ignored. Which brings us to the second response. Jesus was rejected. The world's ignorance is not the worst of it because the tragedy deepens. Not only was Jesus ignored, Jesus was rejected by his own people. John continues, he came to what was his own and his own people did not accept him. Verse 11. Again, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase is helpful. He said, he came to his own people, but they didn't want him. John tells us that he came to what which to that which was his own. You could easily translate this phrase as basically he came home. <laughs> Notice the movement. John is moving from the general, the earth, to the specific, the region known as Palestine, and from the realm of humanity, the whole world, to a certain people group, the Jews. He came to his own land. Palestine, and to his own people, the Jews, and they did not accept him. He came to a land which was particularly God's land in the biblical understanding, and a people who were peculiarly God's people. He should have been coming to a nation and a people that would welcome him with open arms. The door should have been wide open for him. He should have been welcomed like a benevolent king coming to his own kingdom. But guess what? He was rejected. They did not accept him. The phrase did not accept him means not to welcome or not to take one side. Jesus was rejected by the very people he created. The writers of the New Testament found the rejection of Jesus by his own people extremely difficult to comprehend. You know, there's a saying that home is where when you go there, They have to take you in. Jesus came home to his own people, but they wouldn't take him in. Oh, such tragedy. Jesus came to his own people and to the one place where he might be welcome to his hometown and to his own family, and they they did not want him. They did not receive him, and they did not believe in him. And finally, they crucified him. But before we blame them, guess what? That rejection continues in large part to this very day. That's why we need to see that there is a third response. We do not have to reject Jesus. We can receive him. That should be our response. So the question for us is, What can we do to prevent the two previous tragic responses from happening in our lives? What must we do to know and accept Jesus? Well, first we have to have a desire to see Jesus. I think the main reason that the shepherds and the magi or the wise men saw Jesus was because they were curious. For you and me to see Jesus, we too must be curious. To see Jesus today, we must have a hunger, a longing, a craving, and a yearning. If we don't want to see Jesus, we won't. If we don't hunger to see Jesus, we will not catch a glimpse of him. If we don't long to see Jesus as much as we long to breathe the air that we breathe, we will never spot him. It takes willingness, it takes an initiative, and a want to see Jesus. We must be desperate for him. Second, we must open our eyes to see Jesus. You see, Jesus is all around us, but only if we will look for him. Looking outward, we will see amazing order in the universe. And we know that if there is order, there must be a mind, a being behind it all. If we look upward, we will see the stars as numerous as the sands upon the seashores. 
If we look inward, we will discover the power to think, to reason, to know right from wrong. Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher of his day, said that two things convince me of the existence of God. The starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. But we also need to open our eyes to see Jesus in one another. And this one is especially hard. I got myself a small Christmas gift for myself. <laughs> and this small Christmas gift is a digital print of a modern version of a religious icon painted by an iconographer named Kelly Lattimore. Kelly Lattimore, who lives and works in St. Louis. And he builds on the tradition of iconography in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but with a more pro provocative twist. You'll see the picture on the screen. And, and the icon I got was titled Holy Family of the Streets. Holy Family of the Streets. And I'm planning to frame it and hang it in the elevator hall of our apartment so that it would remind me to see Jesus in everyone I encounter, especially those who are the least of these. We must desire and we must open our eyes to see Jesus. And then third, we must not rush to see Jesus. We cannot be like the tourist who would go to a famous spot and never get off their bus. <laughs> or race from one viewing spot to another, take a couple pictures and snapshots for their Instagram account, and they say that they have seen this place or that. They are in constant hurry. They rush. They fight through the congestion and the crowd. They buy a souvenir, but they actually miss out on the actual beauty of the place they are visiting. They look at it, but they don't see and people are the same way with Jesus. They come to church and rush through the motions. They check it off to, in their to-do list. They look at Jesus, but they don't see him. Or they read a verse of the Bible and say a quick prayer. They think they are spiritual. They look for Jesus, but they don't see him. And when I said all this, I include myself in that. Others witness miracles and God's care and protection, but pass it off as coincidence. Jesus is right in front of them. But sometimes the hardest things to see are those things right in front of our eyes, including Jesus. They look, but they don't see. And so for us to see, for us to see Jesus, requires us to slow down, to be still before him, to listen for his voice, to see his work, to watch his movements. We must desire, we must open our eyes, and we must not rush to see Jesus. And finally, we must experience Jesus to see him. Now, let's look at something we all can relate to, food. Right? Taste buds can be described an, 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 uh, bleh, excuse me, anatomically, right? because it is an anatomy, our tongue. And food can be reduced to a chemical equation. A, a scientist could provide me a scientific equation of a plate of pasta with black truffles. But I would say, no, 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 I don't want that. I don't want to, see, to hear that. I want to experience this plate of pasta with black truffles in it by tasting it. My mouth is watering thinking about it already. Because no equation can do justice to devouring a plate of pasta with black truffles. A picture of it or even someone describing the taste is not sufficient. I want it. I need it. I need to taste it. As it is true of a plate of pasta with black truffles, so it is true of seeing Jesus. We have to experience him. Over and over in the Gospel of John, we read these words, come and see, come and see, come and see. To the two disciples of John who questioned where Jesus was living, Jesus replied, come and you will see. To Nathaniel who questioned if anything can come, can good can come out of Nazareth, referring to Jesus, Philip said, come and see. 
And the simple phrase literally means, come with me and you will see. This is an invitation for us to examine and experience Jesus for ourselves. We have heard about him from others. Now we are invited to see for ourselves, to experience him firsthand, taste and see that the Lord is good. Come and see still suffices today. Come and see the rock of ages that has withstood the winds of time. Come and see the impact of many Christ followers and their impact on society. Come and see the changed lives of people who recognize and receive Jesus. The addicts healed, the embittered now joyful, the shame now forgiven. Come and see what Jesus can do. See him touch the brokenhearted to make it whole again. See him wipe the tear of sadness from our face. See him forgive the ugliest sin. Come and see. You see, he avoids no seeker. He ignores no probe. He fears no surge. Come and see. Nathaniel came, and Nathaniel saw, and Nathaniel discovered. And he later said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Perhaps the world renowned, the creator of the universe, and the Savior of the world will pass you by today. And today may be the chance of a lifetime to see Jesus. He is coming, and you have the greatest opportunity to not only have a brush with someone famous, but to recognize and receive him. And so don't pass him by. Let's pray. Don't pass us by our dear and gentle Savior. We know you won't. But as we pray and ask, don't pass us by. We're actually asking that we won't pass you by. Allow us to encounter you and experience you ever anew today. And this experience will be able to set the foundation of our new year to live in and for you and to live in the newness of who we are in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen.